Thanks, Marie. And uh, can I just say what a real privilege it is to be uh, part of a, a, a lineup that includes uh, Justine and and uh, Roger. Uh, and uh, it's really a, a privilege for me also to be able to tell you a bit about my story. Uh, coming from uh, one of the clinical disciplines, which is nursing. So I just want to check how many nurses and allied health uh, professionals are there in the room? Okay, so that's really good. So, uh, so I will um, start off by a, a quick definition. What, what are we talking about when we're talking about a clinician scientist and you know that it's it can be anybody from any discipline who has a health background and it's the mixture of your clinical expertise as well as your uh, uh, curiosity the desire to uh, do something with that knowledge um, okay so now I'm just uh, let me try this one I, I use a Mac, so I've now pressed all these. I better stop pressing. My husband always tells me, you know, the worst thing I do is if nothing if nothing works, I have multiple. Okay, so this is what. Just use that one. Oh, that one. Okay, right. Just use that. One. Okay, so uh, who am I? Just like Roger and Justine sort of talked about um, their journey. This was me. Uh, during the like 40 years ago, early early 80s, so it was just after Roger, um, other side of the world, Northern Ireland. I was the first cohort of um, undergraduate students that came to study for a degree in nursing. That was really controversial in those days. Like, why would anybody want to go to university if you wanted to be a nurse? You know, like just go into the hospital and learn it the hard way. So, so how did I uh, start out as a nursing student 40 years ago and end up as a, a vice president and executive director and a high site researcher focusing on knowledge translation? Well, I have to tell you it was a bit of a hard slog because uh, not only um, were you fighting against this notion that you didn't have to have a university degree to be a competent nurse, but when you did have your degree, and equally, uh, when I got my PhD, first person to get a first class honours degree out of this, first person to get a PhD scholarship in Northern Ireland, uh, graduated uh, with a PhD in my late 20s, and nobody had a clue what to do with me. <laughs> you know, uh, oh yeah, you could be a staff nurse, but just watch because, you know, if you think you know everything, you have to be on this ward 20 years before you can really tell me what you're like. So, okay, so this is then, you know, fast forward. Um, several years later, uh, asked to, to do a distinguished, uh, be part of an international lineup of nursing leaders, uh, University of Sydney was sort of producing this um, sort of series of podcasts. So what happened uh, me in my journey? Well, actually it was very interesting because I ended up doing a PhD. Uh, I ended up um, getting into the evidence-based practice movement. I ended up uh, specializing in, in knowledge translation implementation science because I basically was trying to answer the one question, which is how do I, as a nurse, improve the experience of care for people that I'm looking after? And what I discovered early on in my career was there was, uh, there was very, very little evidence to inform what I as a nurse did or what we as a nursing and allied health professional team did. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, there was very little uh, research investment in, in non-medical research. So really, um, the, the challenges were about trying to make sure that we had um, some sort of credible narrative about the sorts of problems that we wanted to explore in a rigorous and scientific way. And in doing that, we were able to start to generate the evidence, as uh, Steve said, which is going to transform our healthcare systems. 
Of course, I like to dress up, and this is uh, a, a picture of me getting an honorary doctorate at the University of Malmö in Sweden. Uh, it's, uh, about in the early, I think it was uh, 2011, and that was again in recognition of the work that I and a team of people led around um, how do you get evidence into practice. So. What I do now is, uh, unlike Roger and, and Justine, who um, are still uh, leading their labs and undertaking their primary research, I um, probably describe myself as a vicarious researcher. I have to do it through other people. So what I've had to do is set up a college of nursing and health sciences, uh, generate a very integrated vision around excellence in education, research and practice, uh, really motivate uh, the people who are uh, um, sort of producing the next generation of uh, nurses, midwives and allied health professions, and really try and unpack the, this notion of you know, what is science, what it, where does biomedical science stop and where does biopsychosocial science start and for me where does caring science fit into all of that equation and that's why we again three years ago under my leadership we set up a new research institute at uh, Flinders University called the Caring Futures Institute. If you think of some of the huge big uh, wicked problems that we're facing in our society. It isn't that we don't know what to do, it's that we don't know how to get it into the systems that we can actually change attitudes, change behaviours, change practices. So the whole focus of the Caring Futures Institute is to take these clinical areas and then unpack them and understand what we can do at, at the point where practitioners and clients and patients interface. How do we look at that in the microcosm? How do we look at it in systems? And how do we look at it from a much wider um, sort of health service delivery perspective? So I suppose you would call that health services research. So we're a mixture of health services research and intervention research. And within the Caring Futures Institute, we have a number of enabling themes, and these are the things that sort of cross all of these clinical areas that we're working in. So my vicarious role continues in that I have, because I can't do it myself, I am um, scouting around the world for really top quality clinician, researchers, uh, nurses, allied health professionals who really have that passion to see a change in practice. And these are just some of the people, and I'm going to profile a few of them. But you can see that we've got uh, uh, people from all over the world who are coming to the Caring Futures Institute to work with us. Uh, these are our joint appointments, uh, Annette, uh, Yaron, Stacey, Robin, and Sarah. So I'm going to start with, uh, uh, well, again, the, uh, I was going to start with Yaron, but I've realized I've got one one slide before you're on. Um, I think this is really important, and again, Steve mentioned it, that it, it's, there, there is a real commitment from the Department of Health, from um, the MRFF, from NHMRC, to really embed and invest in clinician researchers. And certainly, we are very, very clear that it, it has to be the whole clinician spectrum. Uh, we want to be part of that team of people who will lead uh, things forward for the future. So you're on, again, those of you who are from, um, uh, who work at the uh, um, Adelaide, um, the Royal Adelaide Hospital may have come across you on. He is our Leo Mar Cardiovascular Chair of Nursing, working very closely with his medical colleagues in the Heart Rhythm Disorders Unit. He, his specialization is in looking at atrial fibrillation and developing interventions uh, that can really improve the, uh, the management of atrial fibrillation. You will know that that is very much about self-care, self-management and knowing how to triage uh, how people manage their symptoms. 
Euron is from the Netherlands. He did his PhD in Sweden. He came to Australia. He's now working with us and is a great role model for other uh, really talented um, postdocs that are working with him. Annette is a midwife who uh, worked in uh, St. Thomas's before she came here, uh, incredibly well experienced in uh, multi-centered randomized control trials. Marie is nodding, you know Annette, she is absolutely first class. She again is a brilliant role model for all of the mid wives that she's working with in uh, Lyle McEwen, really keen to actually try and improve that the sort of expectations, the routines, the way that we as nurses, midwives and allied health professions actually do our jobs. For example, like most health systems spend over 60% of its uh, resource on nursing alone, okay? So it doesn't take a genius to work out that if you invested in that workforce and actually tried to improve, you know, like 0.5% of the use of evidence in that workforce, you could get a huge impact. So these are the sorts of roles that can actually make this happen. Again, we're absolutely delighted that Stacey George, who is um, uh, an occupational therapist by background, has just uh, become our inaugural um, joint appointment with uh, Northern Adelaide Local Health Network. And that again is all about trying to make sure that we understand how we keep uh, our clients at home being looked after, not having to you know, experience ramping coming into an acute hospital uh, area. So Stacey is really forging new, new ways of, of uh, collaborative working in this space. And then finally, one of my own postdocs, Sarah Hunter, um, has just again um, got a joint appointment with Wellbeing SA and Caring Futures Institute and that Sarah uh, again has been mentored by me in uh, implementation science knowledge translation. Her, her area of passion is uh, understanding um, the, the role of men in parenting and how different stereotypes, how policies either enhance or detract from um, that parenting experience. So you can see that her working with Wellbeing SA not only will give her some access to vulnerable groups in this area, but will also help her understand how you get uh, evidence into practice as she ex goes on in her experience. So the, the what role does a clinician scientist play? Well, again, we. We, we know that it strengthens and enhances the connection between the clinical, the education and the research. This is really important for, for disciplines or for professional groups that haven't traditionally had that direct access to be able to link those three uh, dimensions of practice. As, as, a, as a, a young uh, researcher, uh, I, I, I never had the choice of extending my um, expertise as a clinician, I basically had to uh, either choose to be uh, a leader in an executive roles or in education. So it, it's actually very reassuring and heartening to know that we're now in systems that will enable really passionate uh, clinicians to be able to hold on to those skills. Um, the other thing that we're doing in the Caring Futures Institute is making sure that um, we, we sort of start from the grassroots. This is an example of a piece of work we did. Um, Joe uh, Murray, who's on your uh, right hand side. Joe is a, a mid-career researcher, speech pathologist by background. Um, uh, an early conversation with me was, you know, she, she as a speech pathologist does assessments on uh, people who've had a stroke and checking swallowing. And she said, you know, one of the biggest things that I notice, Alison, is um, the state of patients' mouths. Nobody cleans them, you know, and, and I, 
what what can we do to improve uh, the oral care of patients in patients? So this is a project that we did collaboratively with Joe, uh, a clinician researcher leading a, a, a team to actually see how we could improve it. And uh, the good news is that we did, but it took a year and a half, but COVID might have played a bit of a, an impact on that. So the challenges for clinician scientists are that um, there's real lack of policy and incentive to support partnerships. This, these are some of the challenges we're facing in our uh, Caring Futures Institute. They take a long time to set up. Um, there's also legal, a lot of legal barriers, uh, you know, employment rights. Um, hard to negotiate and as I said it, they're pretty rare in nursing midwifery and allied health and I know um, a plug for Steve in your new role you know we're we're really excited about that <laughs> because we need more of these um, the challenges are that uh, again not surprising but the assumptions that uh, People in service areas think, well, research is what you do in universities, but no, it's not. Research is what you do all over the place, and you really just need to get your systems, your processes, your teams together to really work. Um, in this uh, state in South Australia, there is a lack of understanding about the joint appointment role. The West Eastern Seaboard, the UK, is pretty uh, more embedded in these roles, but we need to really kick-started in South Australia. So what we need is really uh, mindfully and deliberately to set up partnerships. We need mentorship. We need uh, measurable and, and sustainable KPIs. And uh, we need clear governance structures so that when we set these things up, uh, people know to whom they're accountable. And if that is all done, then our clinician scientists can really flourish. They can um, be, begin to be part of a, a really vibrant community of practice, which enhances partnership collaboration, makes a difference to patient outcomes, and it really enhances multidisciplinary uh, work. Now, what we found after about two or three years, we did a, a review of our, our uh, joint appointments in the, in the um, Caring Futures Institute, and these were some of the things that they had experienced. Um, you know, things like they, after two years, some of them didn't even have an office because there was a lot of uh, controversy, you know, of, of what what status did you have to be in order to have an office in a particular space? Now, yes, uh, but you know, it's amazing how much time, uh, intellectual energy you spend on these sorts of issues. And it would be good if we could sort of get over it and actually put ourselves together and think about the things that really matter to our clients to, and that will give us a better job. So um, I'm just going to, uh, so the, we commissioned a, a sort of a report to sort of uh, recount the clinical academic experience, and these were these are this is our, our uh, work agenda that we're actually um, going to follow through now. Uh, we need to understand the industry partner agenda, get clear governance, uh, develop common um, uh, KPIs, and make sure that it is embedded. And we have uh, Marie on our feet. So, um, and this this is just for you, uh, Steve, because uh, we know that not this one, but embedding change in basic routines is labour intensive. Don't underestimate how long it takes to change what people do. But uh, I would not be me if I didn't finish on a couple of theoretical um, frameworks. So this is for just for you, Steve. You know that in 2018, we developed this thing called the KT, Knowledge Translation Complexity Model. And basically it said that if you really want to make change in practice, you have to understand the problem. You have to know where the knowledge comes from. You have to know how to put it into ways that people understand. You need some uh, understanding of implementation and you need to know how to evaluate it. This is the framework that we use in the Caring Futures Institute. 
for each of our areas of focus, our clinical areas. We're teaching people how to do that. And not only are we doing that, but we're teaching them a new model about the caring life course theory, which is a new scientific approach to understanding care across the lifespan. And that, I think, is the way that we are going to make a difference. So we're really keen to work with you guys, uh, really keen to see how we can create that whole continuum of science and the common denominator is excellence. And these are the people, Ray Chan, our new director, Beck Gully, our deputy director, me as the foundation director. So this wee Northern Irish girl in a, in, a, in, a, in a nurse's uniform 40 years ago has finally achieved what she could have done 20 years ago if it hadn't been so hard. So let's go for it. Thank you.